I make one of these videos every year. The last one was 10 things I wish I knew about FL Studio when I started. So this is gonna be a bit of a continuation from that, but I've also been testing the unreleased version of FL Studio that has some really cool features. So some of these will be completely new, Others are old, but they're just features you really need to know about. And then I'm also going to be suggesting some features that I just wish the software had. So the first one is a new feature that's coming soon. We're going to get more than 125 mixer tracks, which I know for a lot of people is really, really big news. I was mixing a song this week and I only needed 35 tracks, which is you know pretty common. But if you scoot all the way over to the end of the mixer, you can see that you can just add tracks. You can add them from your presets or just any number up to a total of 500 tracks for now. I have noticed that it increases the CPU load a little bit, but you can see here, that's so many more tracks than we used to have, and it's great that there's no limit on your creativity in that regard. I know some people are never gonna use 125 tracks, but for many people with huge you know, orchestral compositions, 125 tracks, you can get through that pretty easy. So now I'm gonna go through a bunch of settings that I just really think you should have either turned on or off in the software. And I've shared some of these in my short form content over on Instagram, but I wanted to put them all here as well. So firstly, on the piano roll, if you just go into here, view key labels, change this to all notes. It's gonna make writing your chords and melodies so much easier. You'll have every note on the piano labeled. Also importantly, if you're going through menus like this, if you right click, it keeps the menu open when you can switch between different modes. If you left click, it's gonna close the menu and you're gonna to have to go back in again. That's one, I think that took me three or four years to figure out on the software and it was such just like a massive face palm when I figured that one out. The next setting that I would highly recommend changing if you're doing any audio editing is the PPQ or pulse per quarter settings in your project settings here. So it's set to 96 by default. Take it anywhere up to 960. It is gonna put a bit more strain on your computer but what this means is that you can zoom in on samples a lot more closely. So with it set to 96, this is as far in as I can zoom, which looks great until you change it to 960. Then you can zoom in all the way. This is so important for checking the polarity of your samples. If you don't know about polarity and phase, check out this video here. But it also means you can make extremely precise cuts, realign waveforms, all sorts of stuff. It does also make the automation in your project smoother because you're, there's physically more points that you can draw on an automation curve. Now, whether this is gonna make a sonic difference or any meaningful difference in your project, that's a, sort of a debate or an argument for another day. But if your projects are heavily automation dependent, you're doing all sorts of incredible sound design, you might find that increasing the PPQ setting allows you to get a little bit more precision with your automation clips. And while we're in the settings, just attach all your plugins by default when you've got all these plugins open, it's not gonna close them all. When you open a new plugin, detach by default keeps them all up. You'll know when you're mixing. Your plugins are not individual little effects. They all add up, they're all a system. So if you're running different effects into each other, it's really useful to just see them all on the screen at the same time. Detach by default, it'll save you wasting time detaching them individually. A feature that was recently added was this automatic crossfading of samples. And while it's amazing to actually see proper crossfading implemented on FL, it's quite annoying. So on this mix I was working on, I wanted to move some of these chords around to speed up the, um, the arrangement, the composition. So I'm using uh, the Y shortcut key just for the playback. These are the two chords. And by the way, the cut tool is now gonna default to a vertical slice, which is just amazing because up to now, I think you've had to press shift to get it vertical. But if I make a cut here and drag this chord over, you can see it automatically crossfades it which in this case is the last thing I want to do. And while I can manually edit these points here, it can be a little bit annoying grabbing the right one. So what I do here is go into the settings and I just turn off this crossfading by default. It's sort of hidden right at the bottom here, but if you just turn this off, it means that now they're not going to automatically crossfade when you slice, uh, sort of drag two clips over each other and you can control the crossfading much more easily however you want. This is particularly important when you're editing vocals because you just can't have them, you know, running into each other. And this also reminded me of this feature that I wish existed in FL Studio. Dom Segalis recently showed this. It's a new feature in Cubase. I'm just going to use some of his footage. I'll ask to make sure he's okay with that. If you just hover over different notes and press a, a keyboard shortcut, you can just grab individual either drum hits or vocals and just drag them up and down, automating them like this, which is just an absolute no-brainer. I can't believe every DAW didn't have this five years ago. 
that's something I would love to see in FL Studio. When I saw this, I just thought of all the hours I've spent automating vocals and drums. And if you're a Cubase user, definitely check out Dom's channel. Thank you very much for letting me use that footage. Now this next one is a visual aid and I don't usually recommend at all mixing with your eyes, but it's occurred to me working with many clients uh, over the years that some people just never bounce out their mix and actually look at it. Because sometimes when people are running into big problems, it's because they can see, hey buddy, you good? Sorry, sometimes when people are uh, running into big problems, it's because their projects are full of all this MIDI and audio and they never actually look at it. What I would recommend doing is bouncing out or exporting your file, physically dragging it back in and it will tell you an awful lot. I've seen mixes like this where it's just clipping, but it's also like, like at minus six dB. So there's so much more room that could have been used and there's clearly a mastering compressor or limiter completely set wrong. And on the other side, I've also seen mixes where just looking at it can let you see that the drums are way too loud. Like maybe you've got a lot of ear fatigue and you can just visibly see that all these peaks are just sticking out well on top of the mix. And it can also reveal a huge amount about the dynamics. You know, if I just cut this up, move this up, you know, this is probably more what you'd like your mix to look like. And it can show you if you're just dealing with this, you know, constant volume the whole time. Like where can you fit more into this track? Where can you push and pull things to get it sounding good? Talking of samples, most sample packs are going to have the key and BPM labeled right on the sample, but this is not true for my own archive of personal samples. Sometimes I come across something that just says drum loop. Guessing the BPM, don't waste your time. You can see that if I drag this into the project here and just hit play, it's clearly at the wrong time. You can speed it up, slow it down, try to figure it out, but it's much more simple than that. Just select the sample, right click, detect BPM. Give it a range if you want to. I usually do 75 to 150, that covers most things, and then it will just show you the BPM. Now that doesn't mean your project needs to be set to 120, you can use all of these different stretching modes. And what I would recommend is, don't just listen to someone's advice if they say, oh, the mono mode's the best, the stereo mode, the elastic stretch, the retime, just literally try them out and listen to them. On certain vocals, samples, any of these stretching modes could actually theoretically sound best to you. So use those to like warp and bend your samples into the right tempo for your project. If I just go back to the mixer for a moment, it just reminded me, thinking about adding more tracks to the mixer, it made me think about why we don't have presets for like a group of tracks at a time. I was talking with someone about this recently and I thought it was silly, but then on reflection, I'm thinking, if I always mix drums the same way, but I don't want to load up a template because I'm partway through a project, why can't I just load, say, 10 mixer track states at the same time from a preset? Unless there's actually a way to do this and I'm completely missing something, in which case tell me in the comments. Um, but we can save and load one mixer track state at a time, so why not all of your vocal tracks at the same time? That, that would be a pretty cool feature. And if it doesn't exist, I'm definitely going to go onto Loop Talk and request it right now. Now, I did mention this and show it in detail in that previous video, so I don't want to fully repeat it, but whenever I show this to people, they're always it amazes them, is that FL Studio is recording all of the MIDI inputs at all times, even if you're not pressing record. So if you want to see the full thing, I guess click through, I'll, I'll timestamp it on this video. But if you're recording, performing on keys or drums, but you forgot to press record or you were just jamming, you can just dump all of those notes into the piano roll. I think for the last like half hour or something, but certainly the last few minutes. The last one I'm gonna leave you with is really boring, but it's just a reminder to zip up all of your projects when you're finished. I recently found an old archive with loads of my old projects and it was so special going through all of that and seeing where I was like eight, nine, 10 years ago compared to where I've come to now. So I wouldn't want anyone else to miss out on that. Just save your stuff, put it on the cloud or on a hard drive and you'll find it years later and it's gonna be awesome. Just before I finish the video, I do wanna talk about these feedback live streams I've been doing. So about twice a month, if you go to my live tab, you'll see the next one scheduled where you can submit your music, your mix. If you haven't been getting the notifications for those, again, I wouldn't want you missing out on that. It's all on my live tab and I share it on my Instagram and everywhere else. But you know, all the links for that, I'll also put in the description. Anyway, I'll see you all in the next video. Bye for now. Actually, no, uh, <laughs> I made a mistake there. I was gonna say Serum 2 was released uh, just this last week and I've had you know so many comments asking me like what I think of it. Um, I'm literally just downloading it. I will be making a beginner's guide to it and all of my, uh, well, I say all of my sample packs. I only have one sample pack for Serum. I released it many, many years ago, but I always said, 
I was only going to release one and it would be free updates for life. So of course that will be another free update to Serum 2. I'll make sure that everything is compatible. We'll add some more presets in. Serum 2 is a free update for Serum 1. People that have already bought Serum, it feels very weird saying Serum 1. I'll always know that as Serum. I wanted to reassure people about that, but now for good. I hope you have a lovely week and I'll see you in the next video. Bye for now.